18 years old today. What we found out in this budget is a confirmation that the federal budget will not be balanced until you're 50 years old and you will be paying for the $1 trillion in debt. During what one hopes will be the one single Liberal mandate, they will have managed to rack up a deficit of $100 billion with nothing to show for it. The opposition leader is not too impressed with today's budget. So, how was your budget day? Still have made up your mind? Maybe Andrew Chantel and Jennifer Ditchburn can help. They're all in Ottawa tonight. Uh, Andrew, uh, you start us. I mean, they were pretty direct, the opposition leaders, as they always are on days like this, but have they got a point? Well, it's a strange budget. It's a complacent budget. It's a failure in many ways. I'm not sure whether it's worse because of what it does or what it doesn't do, but taking off the top what it doesn't do, it doesn't treat the deficit seriously at all. Uh, every time they restate the figures, the deficit situation worsens. Uh, the time when we're ever going to get back to a balanced budget recedes further and further into the future. They seem to show no concern for that, whatever. And then uh, we have this, this strange kind of reshuffling of the deck with their various programs for encouraging innovation. We know from a recent report that there's already 147 different programs. They've added a bunch, reshuffled a bunch of others. But what they don't see is a serious program for encouraging innovation and productivity, which would involve uh, reforming our tax system, getting the tax rates much lower than they are, uh, opening our uh, economy to more competition to, to give that kind of stimulus to, to productivity. We know what's coming down the pike, at least in the broad strokes from the Trump administration, the Congress. I don't see why we have to wait until they actually pass legislation there to get started. Why not get started now? John Dell? I thought it was a very cynical budget in the sense that it opens up all kinds of possibilities, but commits the government to very little, in, in this year, to very little spending, to back it up. Uh, it triggers a lot of spending just in time for the election, mm -hmm. but leaves it open once the government is re-elected or not, uh, whether those programs continue. And you and I were around when the Conservatives ran, for instance, on the National Child Care Program in 88, mostly talked about free trade. That was in the picture. Day after the election, never heard from again. You know, you two are making the opposition leaders sound kind in, in what they had to say. Uh, something tells me Jennifer may be uh, taking a different approach. Jennifer. Well, I mean, it, you know, it wasn't uh, lighting my hair on fire, this, this budget, but um, I think the th there's, there's interesting thinking there. They're obviously doing the, the, the right kind of policy thinking around um, skills, around the changing nature of work, um, around innovation, climate change, and um, the people in society that don't necessarily benefit from economic growth. It's just that a lot of these um, things that they, they talked about, there was really sketchy details, or as Chantal pointed out, um, the rollout is in, in for 10, 11, over a period of 10, 11 years, or there's no spending for two or three years, um, or there's just very minimal um, expenditure on some of their different initiatives. So to me, it's kind of a mixed bag. It's, um, it's as if they're on the, on the right road, but they ran out of fuel <laughs> as they were going along. You know, I, I tried to, to get him on the deficit at the, the top of the program. Rosie Barton earlier today went after him on, like, how, how is this going to work? How, how are you going to sell this? that it's going to make a difference in the economy. And here is his answer. Watch this. Investing is what optimistic countries do. Investing in sectors where we know we can beat the world. So you mentioned agriculture, you know, digital technology, advanced manufacturing, health, life sciences, clean technology, natural resources. These are places where Canadians know that we have an advantage. We're going to invest. And what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that for those Canadians that want to be in those sectors, we'll help them to get the skills so that they can really get the great jobs. Okay, does that fly, Chantel? Except they're not going to be investing anytime soon, or maybe not very much until the next election. Uh, the problem with government is that government is about setting priorities and making choices. Uh, and this is like a, a buffet where no one is making a choice. It says, uh, if you show up, all these things might be on the table, but we're not going to tell you which ones we're really going to accomplish. So at the end of the day, it sounds more like what they hope to be their platform for the next election than a program for a government that is actually in power. How do you sell, or can you sell, what they put on the table today, Jennifer? Well, I, I actually, I think there's a few areas that, that they could sell. It's just that, you know, the story is, is mitigated. So 
for example, I think you can sell the fact that you're talking about um, putting a bunch of money into child care. This is an issue that's important to women across the country. It cuts across ca class levels, income levels. Uh, but the, it's not uh, nearly enough money that's needed to give the spaces that, that Canadian parents need. And the funding is over uh, a long period of time, and they don't have an agreement with the provinces yet. It's sort of a wait and see uh, what will happen. So um, I think if there was any selling point, it would be on um, the parental leave, uh, pr change to parental leave, child care um, spaces, um, and also some uh, changes to um, uh, help for people who want to improve their skills. Those are the three areas I think stand out. Andrew? I was struck by the minister's uh, certainty that these were can't miss, surefire, definite winners, these industries that he'd selected. If that's the case, then you would think people who are investing their own money would be at least as capable of realizing that as the government. So this enthusiasm for picking winners, uh, which is, you know, has a long and rather sordid history, of, you know, handing out grants to businesses that can't hack it on their own uh, is not a particularly sterling track record. And, and why the Liberals have now decided that this is the, uh, the height of innovative thinking, uh, you know, 1970-style industrial policy is a great mystery. Oh, but it makes for great announcements and photo ops in an election campaign. <laughs> that is very and it true. keeps people on side because money you don't have yet. And I've just come back from one of the multiple, you know, stakeholders and other uh, parties tonight. The money you don't have that's in the window keeps you saying nice things about the government in the hope yeah, of sure. getting it. So it's politically palatable. It may not be terribly responsible. That's the thing. Is they're spraying money in 500 different directions in little micro droplets. And every person who receives that money, there's no doubt, they will be grateful. And as Chantel says, uh, eager for more. Uh, but the sum total of the impact on the economy, and particularly when as I say, productivity and innovation is absolutely a critical concern for the country. The government's right to identify that as a concern, but this approach is not going to be helpful. On the issue of the deficit, we saw today, as I pointed out to the minister, two very different approaches to deal with the deficit. Saskatchewan government, which has a, you know, obviously a much smaller deficit, but they decided to attack it today, raise, raising certain taxes, doing a few other things. Um, this government, no. They're, they're not going after the deficit. At least they're not going after it yet in any significant way. Is there a right and wrong anymore on the deficit issue, Jennifer? Well, they, they, they seem to um, be focused on the debt to GDP ratio. And, they, and according to their projections, that's not going to change. And they sort of box themselves into, OK, we're going to keep it at, well, I think it's around 30 percent or 31 percent. So I think they've kind of, um, deficit is a word that they just don't use anymore. Um, but it, it's difficult to cut spending. I mean, you leave, when you leave things underfunded, you get into a situation where, like we have now, where children who live on, on reserves in Canada aren't getting the same welfare treatment as children who, who live in different provinces. I mean, where are you going to cut? That's the problem that every uh, government has. And there were, there, we have to admit, there were areas uh, in government that were left underfunded for a long time, uh, and they, they had to be addressed at some point. It is called making choices, though, and that mm -hmm. is what governing is about. And this budget is free of any choices at some point. It leaves uh, the federal government at the mercy of whatever happens uh, uh, to the world economy and interest rates. It also builds up, and this budget offers little structural that will be staying. They're all things that you can say, well, you know, this deficit now is uh, out of control, so I'm not going to do any of these things. And in the end, you will have squandered a lot of money, built a deficit, and gotten very little in return. All right, Andrew. Um you love talking about parliamentary reform, and in a way that became an issue today as the Conservatives delayed the budget um, for about a half an hour because they're upset about the way the Liberals are going about trying to change some of the uh, process arrangements inside Parliament. Uh, there's a number of them. Um, here's how Ronna Ambrose explained why they did what they did. Look, the opposition parties, all of us, um, are shocked at the Prime Minister's level of arrogance in his desire to push through changes in our Democratic House of Parliament to make it so he centralizes his power. A Trudeau centralizing his power is the accusation of something he said he would never do like his father uh, had done in the 1970s. Um, have they got an argument on the way this is being put forward, the changes to the process, everything from question period timings and, and a variety of other things? Yeah, they've got an argument both on the substance and the process. We've learned, I think, too, that there's a difference between what Justin Trudeau says and what he does uh, on many occasions. 
And particularly, we've learned, I think, to be cynical about his approach to democratic reform after the electoral reform debacle. Uh, we were quite properly outraged, those of us in the media and on the opposition benches, when the Harper government tried to pass the Fair Elections Act, so-called, uh, without getting uh, all cross-party consensus on something that affected every party. Uh, we see something of the same here, where they're trying to, to ram through changes to parliamentary procedures in the name of, quote-unquote, efficiency, many of which would either restrict the ability of, of uh, Parliament to debate matters or to ask questions. So, for example, the Prime Minister would, would only ask her questions once a week rather than every day. Uh, substantively, I think there's real questions there. But as I say, the, the, to be just pushing ahead without uh, getting buy-in from the opposition parties is pretty uh, bad form. And I can see the opposition parties feeling they have to raise the alarm about this because people aren't really paying attention to this. So maybe this was their opportunity today. Jennifer? Yeah, I mean, uh, this, it's a day where there's so much attention focused uh, on the news because of the budget. Um, it, it would seem like they, it was a good opportunity, as Andrew said, to bring attention to the issue. And it does fly in the face of, of what they came to government on a message of doing politics differently. I mean, boy, every government <laughs> says this. Yeah. Uh, but it's, you know, it's pretty early <laughs> into the mandate where they're already um, doing things from such a sort of, you know, top, from the king down kind of uh, approach, I guess. Now, of course, I suppose they could argue that this is one way of doing politics differently, some of the changes yeah. that we're doing. But Chantel's not buying that, but you get the last uh, word, Chantel. Well, uh, the, this reform and the approach to it will not make Parliament more meaningful. It will make going, getting stuff to Parliament more convenient. I can't see that that's a great approach. A majority government has already quite a lot of power without abusing it by changing the rules in the House without a consensus basis. All right. We're going to leave it at that for, uh, for this week. Jennifer, good of you to join us, as always. Chantel and Andrew, both in Ottawa. They were in the lockup today, uh, reading the budget and getting briefed just so they could do that issue tonight. Thank you both.